Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. And uh, this is a lecture for my Philosophy of Mind course, Phil 153. We've just finished talking about Descartes and Descartes' introspective method for figuring out what the mind is, what the contents of the mind are, how the mind is constructed, and so on. And we're now considering some modern research from the 1970s, 1980s, 1970s, from two famous psychologists, and this is a really important uh, survey paper that they published, called Telling More Than We Can Know Verbal Reports on Mental Processes by Richard Nisbet and Timothy DeCamp Wilson. And the reason we're going to look at this is because uh, we're going to take a serious pass at all of these claims that Descartes took for granted about having access to your own mind, all these things we thought had to be true, we sort of accepted Descartes' a priori arguments for, turns out under close, careful, empirical scrutiny, turns out we know very, we know much less about what's going on in our own minds than we think we do. And it takes a bunch of this empirical psychology research to see it. So that's what this discussion is about, and we're going to summarize some of that material from uh, Nisbet and Camp Wilson. Okay, so what were Descartes' uh, assumptions or implicit principles or explicit principles and conclusions about the mind? Well, Descartes thought, as we all do, that surely I know what I do and what I don't believe. I've got good access to that. Um, I know why I believe the things I believe. I ask you, why do you believe things? And you tell me, and I believe those. I accept that. And you think, you assume that you're a good authority on why you believe the things you believe and what you believe. I know when I change my mind. It's a, it's apparent to me when my beliefs change from one thing to another that I can see that happen in my mind. I know why I change it. These are all implicit or explicit um, claims that Descartes makes in the meditations, and they also just seem like straight-up common sense. It just seems like there's no possible way you could be mistaken about any of that. <clears throat> and when I'm certain then I really know something's true. So Descartes has this sense that he knows something through the light of reason. He's absolutely sure about it. He couldn't possibly be mistaken and so on. And as a result, he takes those conclusions to be safe or incorrigible. So Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson are going to come in now with this survey of dozens, hundreds of uh, studies from the literature that are going to show that all of that's wrong, or at least to some degree, most of that's mistaken. As implausible as that sounds. Okay, so a little more on Descartes. We take it that you are the authority on you, the contents of your own mind. So if I ask you, why do you like that guy? Or how do you solve this problem? Or why did you take that job? And we have a conversation where, you, where what unfolds is you answering the question and you providing a bunch of ideas, information, reasons for all of that. When you think, I distinctly remember putting my keys right here, like you have this very vivid image. Now you can be mistaken about where the keys are, but we think that you're the authority about what you're believing, what you're remembering, what you think is going on in your own mind, right? So you can certainly be wrong about the keys, but but you remembering that you put the keys there, that has this sort of powerful, vivid, um, intense, undeniable feel to it. I know I put my keys right there, you say. Or you think, I don't like the smell of her perfume, and the not liking or the displeasure or the, or the aversion you're feeling is something that's authoritative. It's something you have. You couldn't be wrong about that. I never say to you, no, actually, you do like her perfume. That would be weird. It would be bizarre for me to tell somebody that they don't like something they like or that they like something they say they don't. Why do you always order rice or whatever? I get this answer from you that we take to be authoritative about the reasons why this thing happens. Who do you think will be a good president? And again, we take it that you are a good source of information about your ideas about that. Not whether or not they're going to be a good president, but, but the ideas and the source of the ideas, we take it to be authoritative as coming from you. Okay, so a little more formally, and we did this with Descartes earlier in our lecture, um, I've got some labels or some principles here to identify from Descartes, either implicitly or explicitly, Descartes holds these views. So Descartes seems to hold some view uh, about cognitive transparency. 
And that is to say, if some idea, belief, content is in my mind, then it will be evident to me that it's in my mind. I'll be able to see it. Furthermore, uh, Descartes makes a presumption about cognitive incorrigibility. So what does that mean? I can't be mistaken about what I take to be the contents of my own thoughts. If I look in and see it there, it's actually there. I can be wrong about what I believe, but if on introspection I take X to be a content of my own mind, then it's true that X is one of my mental contents. And that's another one of the presumptions that we get from Descartes. Descartes thought he had access to his beliefs. If I believe it, then I am, or I can become aware that I do, and the same for my disbeliefs. So it's never going to happen that I have beliefs that I, that I don't know I do, or that I have disbeliefs that I'm not aware of, and vice versa. And he also thought he had justification access. I have privileged access to the reasons, the evidence, or considerations that led to my believing what I do. So when Descartes thinks through his reasons for what he believes, um, that's all manifest and obvious to him too. My reasons for believing P will be incorrigible, which means I can't be mistaken about it, and transparent for me. Another way of understanding the angle here, sometimes it's, these get called first-person mental state reports. So in Descartes, um, anything I say about what's going on in me first person is a mental state report, and those are always right. Now, I can be wrong about um, whether or not I'm seeing um, the fire in the fireplace, right? So Descartes worries famously that he's dreaming, he's hallucinating, he's insane, or he's being deceived by an evil demon. Um, and so, and he asks, okay, well, what can the evil demon deceive me about? The evil demon might deceive me about everything in the world, might make me think the whole world is something other than it is, or, you know, uh, grossly deceive me about the real nature of things. But that I'm thinking about it, or that I'm reflecting on the possibility of being deceived, or that I'm thinking about my own thoughts, or and I'm thinking about a fire, that I can't be mistaken about. So Descartes builds his foundationalism on that starting point. Like that rock is something that he says can't possibly be mistaken. And from there, he's going to build back all our knowledge. Okay, well, what's going to happen is that Nesbitt and DeCamp Wilson are going to now undermine uh, your confidence in all of that stuff. All of this stuff that seems so common sense, seems so clear from Descartes. Um, they're going to argue, and here's some of this is a bit of jargon from their uh, article, they're going to argue that people cannot accurately report on the effects of stimuli, that is, stimulus in your environment, that, that you know, things happen and then you form these beliefs, you can't report accurately on the effects of stimuli on your higher order inference-based responses. You can't report on the existence of stimuli. There's a lot of times where there's a stimulus that actually affects what you believe or changes the content of your mind and you're completely unaware of it. Um, furthermore, when people do report, they employ an implicit a priori theory about causal connections between stimuli and response from culture, experience, and folk psychology. Now, it's going to take me a bit to explain this, but the idea here is fundamentally and profoundly anti-Cartesian. Descartes thought, I look in and I get this perfect, immediate, direct, incorrigible access to what's going on in my mind. They say, no, actually what happens is that you theorize or you build a story or a causal theory about why you said what you said. That's similar to the way you theorize about what other people say when, th when they're doing something. So if somebody tells you something, you figure out, you know, uh, you figure out what the cause is for that belief. You do the same thing about yourself. You have a theory that you use that's an empirical theory that's based on observation. It's not based on some special privileged access. Um, Furthermore, some subjective reports are accurate, so it's not as if all is lost, but not due to any special, magical, introspective awareness. Rather, it's due to an incidentally correct a priori theory. Now, what they mean by a priori is that you've already got it in your mind, but what's important here is that this so-called a priori theory in Nisbet de Camp Wilson, it comes from your experience of watching people behave. You've watched enough hungry people um, order food and then eat and manifest symptoms of hunger to be able to form a theory about, oh, that kind of belief or that kind of behavior is connected to those kinds of beliefs. And that's something you acquired through experience of watching and observing and developing this theory about what goes on in the world. Um, so that's a, a, a theory based on experience and based on observation. 
And what's fundamentally and profoundly anti-Cartesian about that is that you'd have to look out and gather experience and form an inductive generalization about behavior and beliefs on the basis of what you've seen. That's really weird. That's not Descartes. Descartes thinks, no, even if the whole world is false, even if the evil demon is completely grossly dece deceiving me about the nature of everything, the one um, sacrosanct, uh, perfect access, um, invulnerable place is my own mind and my special access to it. So, you know, and Descartes famously is a rationalist. Descartes built all back all this knowledge without any appeal to the empirical world or the external world. Descartes doesn't think he needs the external world, that he's he builds all this knowledge out of just this uh, introspective access. Okay, so Nismet and Camp Wilson are rejecting that. Um, also, I'll just make a point here about, here's the first page of their study. And one of the things we all get to learn to do well is read a scientific abstract. So the abstract is this first, usually 200 word long synopsis that comes at the beginning of the paper where the authors tell you this is what we're doing. So that is the most 200, most important 200 words in the whole article. That's where they sat down. I mean, I've written these for my articles. And if you've only got 200 words, it's like Twitter, right? You've got to um, say only the most important, central, essential things. You have to say them as clearly and succinctly as you possibly can. So a scientific abstract is a, is a very important section of the paper. Take some time, look at it, read it slowly, read it three times, read it five times, think it through, see what they're saying. Because this is where they're telling you what's happening. So a few highlights out of this one. They say subjects have little or no directive introspective access. So that's this anti-Cartesian position. Subjects are unaware of a stimulus that makes them believe or change their beliefs or have the ideas they do. Subjects are unaware of their own responses to these stimuli. Um, they're unaware that the stimulus has affected their response. They just are clueless about what's going on in the world around them. Um, and also, as I said, this is a good chance to practice, to learn this thing, to read the abstract of a scientific paper. Um, and lots of people can't do this. Many times you'll go read a science journalism like in the New York Times or the Washington Post or something. Usually those authors are pretty good, but even those folks can't read a scientific abstract very well. If you go look at the actual study that they were reporting on, you'll find out, oh, actually the study is saying something very different than what they said it was. So very important. This is the, the kernel, the essence of the paper. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of research here. Nisbet and Camp Wilson covered dozens of, of articles, dozens of studies. I'm just going to catch a few of them, maybe eight or ten. We're going to capture a few of these studies and see how they have these anti-Cartesian, anti-introspection uh, implications. Okay, so this is an old study. Uh, what they did is they took students and pulled them about integrated busing. That's how old it was. It was back when there was a controversy about having white kids and black kids in the same school bus. So Back in the 50s, you poll people about that, and then you put them in groups. Um, and the way they did in this study is they put them in groups of people who were for or people who were against, and then they planted a confederate inside the groups, and they had the confederate argue persuasively for the opposite view. So there's somebody in the middle of the group who's working for the researchers who sells them out. And then what you do after they have this discussion section is you poll them again about their beliefs, and they change their views. Okay, not surprisingly, they had a conversation, somebody made a really persuasive argument for the opposite view, and the subjects who originally said that they believe one thing, now they claim to believe, or their views change sharply. Okay, then you ask them, go back and say, what was your view originally? Ask them about the view that they had originally, and they revise their report about what their original view was to match the new one. That is, um, I believe X to begin with, somebody talked me into believing Y, and now you ask me, what do I believe? And I say, oh, I believe Y, and, they, and then you ask me, uh, well, what did you believe for? What did you believe before? Oh, I always believe Y. That's obvious. Everybody knows that, right? Um, and a good example here might be the way people uh, talk about gay marriage. So, you know, the whole country kind of flipped, and all these states um, turned over on this a few years back, where it suddenly became 
um, sort of widely accepted to, 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 you know, where something that used to be really controversial and something that 10 years or 20 years ago, lots and lots of people were very uh, vigorously opposed to it. But now it's just become sort of passe and everybody accepts it. So you'll see a lot of this now. If you ask lots of people, what do you think about gay marriage? They go, obviously, there's nothing wrong with that. And you ask, what did you think 20 years ago? Well, I always thought it was fine. It was, it was perfectly, there's nothing to be objection. There's no objections about that. It's normal. Uh, so people revise their reviews. They radically change their minds, and then they change their memories of their former view and hide the change from themselves. And that's the really scary and really anti-Cartesian point here, is that all of this shifting is going around in your own head about what you believe, why you believe it, um, wh when you change your mind, and you erase or hide the changes from yourself. Um, that, that really undermines the suggestion that you are this authority about about what's going on in your own mind, and then and then when you ask them why did you change your minds or did this discussion that we had about integrated busing lead to you changing your mind? They believe that the discussion didn't have any effect on it. I didn't change my mind. Um, it didn't change or modify my position. That's what I always thought, and I just ended up believing the same thing after that I did before. That conversation was interesting, but it didn't change my view. Right, so people are stubborn sort of that way and they say face that way. Um, okay, here's another one. Um, ask subjects in a room to tie two hanging cords together that won't reach each other and they're too far, too far apart to reach between and subjects are sort of stumped. And there's a researcher, this guy Mayer, would walk around the room with a clipboard and he'd sort of, you know, he's making observations and he would casually make one of the cords swing uh, to get it, get it moving. Uh, very often, subjects would figure out the solution to the problem within 45 seconds of the cue. And I think what you had to do was pick up a weight on the ground, tie it to one string, get it swinging, go grab the other swing, and then you could grab it and pull, pull the two together. That was the way to solve the problem. They couldn't figure it out until Mayer made one of the ropes swing, and then suddenly everybody, you know, on average, 45 seconds later, they solved it. Okay, so they've been cued. They've had this prime that led them to, to you know, Experimentally, observationally, we can see that they uh, figured out we can time it. We can time it from when Mayer did the trigger. Um, you ask them, though, how did you figure that problem out? They will confabulate, which is a psychological term for lie. They'll make up a story for how they figured it out. They'll say things like, oh, it just dawned on me, or it was the only thing left, or I just realized the cord would swing if I fastened a weight to it. They make up all these stories that have nothing to do with what we know actually caused them to solve the problem. It was Mayer who went over and made one of those ropes swing. You can look at the tape and watch it and see that they didn't figure it out and, you know, Dozens of subjects don't figure it out until Mayer makes the rope swing. Then they figure it out, and then they act like it had nothing to do with him. So, you know, so empirically, from a third-person perspective, we can see what's happening, and the subject is none the wiser, is clueless about what's happening in their own minds or how they're being prompted to learn to figure something out. Another example, you might have heard this, it's called the bystander effect. People are less likely to help those in distress as the numbers of bystanders increases. So if you've got a whole bunch of people watching a car wreck, it's more likely that none of them will call the call for 911. If there's just one person watching a car wreck, they'll call 911 because you know that you're the only one you've got to help out. But if there's a whole bunch of people there, you kind of assume, oh, somebody else will take care of it. Um, so that's called the bystander effect. It's really pronounced. It's very well corroborated. Um, but people are unaware of the influence of the numbers of people that it has on them. And actually, people will deny that the presence of other people didn't do that to them. That didn't influence their behavior. So people, again, will um, be affected, change their minds, change their behaviors. Um, the change or the stimulus will be invisible to them. And then they'll hide the uh, change from themselves and from the researchers. Um, here's a good one. You might have seen some examples like this. Give subjects a card with a smell sprayed on it. Prime them with the word Parmesan cheese, and they report that they like the smell. But if you prime them with the word vomit, like you put it on the card where it smells, and they will naturally dislike it. Very same smell. Only difference, just that the label's different, right? Ooh, that smells awful versus, hey, that smells, I like the smell of that. That's Parmesan cheese. Right. So and that and they don't really realize that that's why they do or it sort of primes them and leads them to think. OK, and this is another really powerful one. Um, the researchers conducted a consumer survey 
by asking a bunch of shoppers in a store to evaluate which article of clothing is the best. And they have them all laid out on a table. Turns out that people have a pronounced bias in favor of the article of clothing that's on the right hand side of the table. Now, I don't know whether this is true of left handed people. I haven't tracked down the study and looked at this. Um, so uh, I can't answer that question. It might be in there, though. Uh, that is, the rightmost article of clothing on the table is heavily overchosen no matter which article you put there. So you control for what it is. You put the dress, you put the slacks, you put the pants, you put whatever there, and you control for it over and over again. And people will pick the rightmost article um, at a higher rate than they should by random chance and a higher rate than they should that would suggest, oh, it's because that dress was just actually a better dress. No, it seems to not matter what we put there. They always seem to prefer, sorry, not always, but there's a, there's a correlation here. Um, there's a tendency to prefer the rightmost article of clothing. Um, but shoppers seem to have no idea that they have a bias for the rightmost. They don't think that's why, but in fact, that seems to be what's going on. Um, so imagine you're uh, conducting job interviews. Uh, it turns out that people have a bias in favor of the first or the last person they interview. And this makes sense, right? If you've interviewed a whole bunch of people, the first one's going to be more memorable and the last one's going to be more memorable. So imagine that if this order bias creeps into all these other important discussions or these other decisions, uh, that can really skew us. Like we think, no, 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 I made the choice. You're, you know, you're the manager at a restaurant and you say, no, I chose the person I chose because they were the best qualified. No, actually, you chose them because they were the last person you talked to or because they're the rightmost on the table, right? Almost all of these folks in the shopper study deny that they had a right-hand bias, and then they confabulate answers about why the rightmost article of clothing was the best. They'll say things like, oh, well, the, the stitching's better, the, the quality of the fabric's better, this is a better article of clothing. Uh, again, making up a story to explain something. After the fact, this is what they mean by you using a theory, a causal theory that helps you explain uh, what's going on, not any kind of special magical access to your own mind. Uh, same goes for attractiveness. Have subjects rate a person's attractiveness. Um, if the person is pleasant and agreeable and enthusiastic, then, pe then they will rate his appearance as, as more attractive. If he's rigid or intolerant and distrustful, then they rate him as unattractive. So, you know, personality matters here and affects who you say is attractive or who's not, but they don't really detect the effects of his behavior on their evaluations, or they even deny it. They say, no, no, it has nothing to do with it. I just think this guy's uh, good looking. I think this guy's not good looking. And they don't realize what's actually leading to them having that conclusion. They deny that it had anything to do with the, the person's uh, temperament or their uh, behavior. Um, Here's another good one. It's kind of cruel. Give subjects a placebo and tell them that it will re reduce heart palpitations, breathing ir irregularities, tremors, and butterflies. So it's just a sugar pill that does nothing, but tell them it has all that effect on them. Um, and then you expose them to steadily increasing but mild electric shocks. Uh, so presumably they got this through a human subject review board. Um, but you, what you've done is you've given them a sugar pill that doesn't do anything but you told them that it uh, has all those effects on them, and then you start exposing them to these steadily increasing mild electric shocks. The pill subjects, the placebo subjects, are subsequently able to endure four times as high amperage shocks than the ones who didn't take the pill for no detectable reason. You know, it's just a sugar pill. It's just all in their minds. Then you ask them, why are you able to take a higher than average amount of shock? And they'll make up a story that doesn't have anything to do with the pill. So the people, again, are unaware of it, but it's having this really uh, pronounced direct effect on their behavior and on their beliefs. Okay, this is a good one. I've referred to this one earlier in the semester. Um, show a bunch of male subjects pictures of women where you've modified some of the pictures so that the women's eyes are dilated and some their eyes are not dilated. So you've sort of photoshopped the pictures to alter them. And then you ask the men to rate the pictures for attractiveness. So you evaluate them. These women are attractive. These are not. And you maybe split them, split them up into two piles or whatever. Turns out the men will show a strong preference for the women with the dilated eyes. You can show that that correlates strongly with the ones that they rate as attractive. 
but the men have no idea. They don't know that the dilated eyes is doing it, and, and they will, in fact, when you ask them, why do you think these women are good looking? And they'll confabulate again reasons about what they find attractive about the, about the pictures. They'll say, oh, I like high cheekbones, or I like redheads, or I like dark eyes, or whatever. Um, they're making up a story, and again, we were, you know, we take you to be the authority of information on information about what's going on in your head, and if surely if you know anything, you know who you're attracted to or why you're attracted to them. Uh, it looks like you 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 don't have much uh, access or, or or reliable information about that. At least not as much as Descartes thought you did. Um, Show, this is another cruel study. Show snake phobic subjects pictures of snakes. Uh, so somebody who says, I'm really afraid of snakes. Play a fake and calm heartbeat recording for them and tell them it's their heartbeat. So here, listen to this, uh, this um, uh, monitor we have on your heart. And I want you to look at some pictures. Oh, and there's some pictures of snakes in here. But the monitor's reading a slow, steady heartbeat. Um, afterwards, they are less afraid of snakes. And what they did was they measured their willingness to go across the room toward a snake. So once you do that to them, they uh, are demonstrably, measurably less afraid of snakes. But none of the subjects reported or noticed that it was the calm heartbeat that reduced their fear. So again, the stimuli didn't uh, register to them that's having a real effect on their beliefs or their feelings. Nor did they report a reduction in fear. So they don't think they're, they're less fearful, but it looks like they are because they're willing to go closer or they're willing to do other things they wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, uh, another example this is similar to the uh, integrated busing example. Manipulate a subject's moral views about some, some topic by having them write and deliver speeches against their own view. So you may have had to do this in like your critical thinking class. Imagine that you get assigned to write about abortion or capital punishment or gay marriage. And what they do is the, the professor has you write for the opposite position of your own view. So figure out where, you know, where you, what do you feel about death, the death penalty? And then write a paper for the opposite position about that, about that topic. So not surprisingly, what happens then is that later, those people's views have shifted towards the contrary view. Once you have to rehearse and think through and talk through this other position, try to imagine what it would be to argue for the opposite view, you temper your views about um, you know, the way you felt about it originally. So that's not that surprising. Like that's the basic principle of a liberal arts education. I mean, that's why you're in philosophy classes. You're supposed to hear these contrary views and it's supposed to help you come to a better understanding of what other people think and why they think it. And it's supposed to moderate and extreme influences in your own thoughts. Um, so then here's the really remarkable thing though, is that you ask them after the fact um, about what's, the, what's your view and they will insist that that was their view all along. Okay, so what's a revisionist historian? You know, this is sometimes controversial. You get, the, you get these revisionist historians who go back and say, oh, well, the Holocaust didn't happen. Um, or, you know, they make up some others. They, they take history and change it from the facts. Okay, well, it turns out we're revisionist historians about our own views, um, which if you reflect on this a bit, it's going to be really disturbing. You realize Wow, so that means whatever it is I think right now, whatever my moral views are about the death penalty, about gay marriage, about whatever, um, I think that the views I have now, I'm prone to think that those are always the views I've had. I'm prone to be changed or have my views changed by things I do or influences from the outside, but then those changes don't uh, are not apparent to me. So for all I know, I could be shifting, blowing around, having all these different moral views from, you know, from one trend to another. But if I'm erasing the changes from myself, it always just seems like, well, I just live here in this set of views I always have. Um, that should give us all pause about this presumption that your access to your beliefs or your memory or your history is something that you can count on, right? So again, fundamentally anti-Cartesian. It also turns out that people um, that people attributed the shifting view to God before and after without noticing the change. So the same thing happens here. If you ask people, um, what does God think about uh, the death penalty or capital punishment or, sorry, same thing, abortion? Um, what does God think about gay marriage? 
uh, first off, they're very they're highly prone to attribute to God whatever view they have. But also, when their views change about what's moral, they'll attribute the new changed view to God too. Oh yeah, um, God's got no problem with uh, gay marriage. Uh, so they'll they'll uh, misattribute the position to God and then hide the changes too. So that's that good. that has some chilling effects that we should reflect on when people are using God to justify their moral views. Uh, it gets worrisome. You start wondering about well, which one is it? Is it the one that you had before, or the one that you had ten years ago, or the one that you had now? Um, which one's God's exactly? And why is God changing as often as you're changing? Um, Okay, so uh, another example, subjects who receive painful electric shocks during a learning task with no explanation. And don't ask me why or how they got away with that kind of study. I don't think you do that so much anymore. Um, those subjects will downplay the painfulness of the shocks more than if they have a reason. And this is weird. Okay, so you shock them, no explanation. They disregard or write it off or dismiss it more so than if you tell them, no, we're going to shock you during this task because we need to do X. So people have very different weird uh, accounts of that. But none of the subjects realize that, that, that that's what they're doing, um, that they're downplaying it because they don't have a reason for it. Lots of research in the background like this in Nisbet and Camp Wilson's paper. Okay, so where do we stand now with the Cartesian uh, introspectionism? Well, it looks like we've got a lot of empirical evidence here from Nisbet and Camp Wilson that people are poor judges of, first off, what they believe, what they feel, what they believe, uh, why they believe or feel it, why they change their minds, and what led them to think what they think, who they find attractive, why they find him attractive, and so on, right? It's, it's that Nisbet and Camp Wilson have clouded this whole... Um, inquiry now that we don't have nearly as much confidence about this special kind of access to what's going on in there. So put it this way. Here's Nisbet and Camp Wilson's theses, or this is part of their conclusion at the end of the paper. Rather than having some privileged, incorrigible access to the private contents of my mind, I observe me, that's this empirical a posteriori theorizing, and I theorize about what I'm thinking, why I act, what motivates me in a way very similar to how I figure out what you think and why. So I'm actually just looking at me and figuring me out and watching me behave and then speculating about my behavior the same way I am about you. I just do it faster. I have more access to information. I've got more familiarity with this subject than I do with you. But there's nothing special here is what they're getting at. And since I'm so close to the subject and I'm so invested, obviously, I'm often do, I often do a poor, biased job of my theorizing about me and what I want and what I think and all that. In many cases, and this is profoundly anti-Cartesian, someone else is in a better position to say what I think than I am. Right? So remember, Descartes said, uh, I know what I'm thinking, and on that, that basis, I'm certain that I exist, and now I can defeat the evil demon skepticism. And they're saying, no, actually, you know, Descartes, you know, dispensed with the whole external world and the other minds and all that. He did all this by himself in this sort of solipsistic universe. No, doesn't Nisbet and Camp Wilson are saying the opposite. Actually, somebody else might be a better judge of what you're thinking and why you think it than you are. Right, so it's the anti-Cartesian position. Um, again, the Cartesian theses we were considering were these: that that you've got perfect cognitive transparency. You can look right in and see what you're thinking and why you think it. Um, you've got it, it, what you believe or what you think is in there is incorrigible, so you can't possibly be mistaken about it. Um, you've got total access to your beliefs. Um, and you've got complete access to the reasons, justifications, and causes of your beliefs. And it looks like that's all suspect in light of all this empirical research that Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson are giving us. All right, so now we've seen Cartesian introspectionism, and now we've got Nisbet and DeCamp Wilson empirical psychologists giving us all this anti-introspectionism empirical research uh, that seems to undermine this classic Cartesian access to the mind.